Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4 as we warm up this morning. And um, I would like to teach in regards to family discipleship, a family worship service, encouraging families to worship together and study God's Word together and be together. You know, over this last month, I've been on a sabbatical, and I want to thank this wonderful church for um, allowing me to do in that and embracing that. And um, taking some time away helps you see from the outside in things more clearly. I think you would agree in that. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 9 to 10, there is a very specific calling for families. And I want you to see that all the way from the Old Testament, this Calling this conviction runs through and through the Bible, so it's nothing new. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9 says this from the New American Standard, only give heed to yourself, okay? First of all, our walk with God starts with us and our own soul and studying the Word of God and praying and actually singing as well. If you study the Word of God and you comprehend the precepts, it'll move you to want to worship Him. And so if you're not worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ as you go through the day, study a little bit deeper. I guarantee you will. Again, verse 9, only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen Listen, you know, we can see things and we can forget things, right? But it's our responsibility to review the precepts in the Bible, to review the Word of God in such a way that we don't forget. And you know how you forget, but you also know you best and how you remember. And so we have this personal responsibility to not only study God's Word and not only to walk with Him, but to do this in a way that we don't forget. Let's read again from the top. Only give heed to yourself... And keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and that they do not depart from um, your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. So now we're moving in this one verse from personal devotion to God to family devotion to God. In one verse, these concepts are concreted into Israelite character and tradition. And we learn from this. This is our example. We have to make it known to our sons and our grandsons. And so you never lose influence. And so grandparents should be not only influencing their children, but also their grandchildren. If you're a grandchild here today, listen to your grandma and your grandpa. Be with them. Love on them. Take time. Don't ignore them. Sit at their feet and see what they have to say from a lifelong experience of wisdom that they have. And in verse 10, Remember the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, assemble the people to me, that I may let them hear my words. If we could pause right there, look at what is obvious. The obviousness of this text is that the people are assembling together. You see no age segregation. When they met to worship, when they met to hear God's word, they were together. The grandchildren the teenagers, the young adults, the parents, the grandparents, everybody worshiped together. And this is something that has been being missed in our church culture. We're going to talk about that today. But you see it right here. Assemble them together, the people to me, that I may let them hear my words so they may learn to fear me. How can our children learn to fear God unless their parents and grandparents see it And it's demonstrated. How can they learn to respect that word fear means to reverence God? We live in a day where reverence is out the door. Respect for authority is gone. God is no longer on the throne for our younger generation. They have no regard for God and no respect and no reverence. That reverence is captivated through a wholesome family who worships together and studies God's word together and prays together. All right, that my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. So you have the responsibility here in the text to teach your children and also the responsibility is to be under authority, to be underneath someone who is teaching you the word of God. Not only in church, yes, we have 
the command to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But we also see that we are to be underneath someone who can be like a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. Someone who can teach us how to act and live according to the word of God. And because of the divisions of the family today, the family is eroding and the strength of churches is families. The strength of countries is families. And there are all kinds of movements out there today who are coming against the local family. It's an attack on God himself. You know, we may have good intentions. We may have sincere intentions, but that still doesn't make them right if we make methods that divide families. And we have been doing that as a church, by and large, for decades and decades and decades. We have created ministries. We have put staff positions in place to age segregate children to divide families and that has never been God's best plan. We have children's pastors, youth pastors, college pastors and beyond. Now, before we discuss this obvious hole in our ecclesiology, let's discuss some solutions from the scripture. We've got to back up just a little bit and work on some things. It's going to take weeks for us to unfold this subject that I'm bringing to the forefront of our mind today. So come every week if you would. Listen every week if you can't come and stay in touch with where we're going. This is for us a church, a paradigm shift. We've been going in this direction for quite a while, but now we're really going to embrace this idea of family discipleship, of family worship. So we'll be working on this biblical paradigm for quite a while, especially this month. And then we'll jump back into the Gospel of John and continue to explore and study it verse by verse by verse. But point number one for today is God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That was said in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Turn to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. If you would like, I'm going to read verse 6. I'm sorry, Malachi 3, 6. I want you to see it for yourself, that it is an impossibility for God to change. He is perfect. You cannot make perfection better. It's already perfect. And so Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6 should be highlighted in your Bible. For I, the Lord, do not change. Very simple. I, the Lord, do not change. In fact, his word does not change as well. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but what? The word of the Lord stands forever. And so God doesn't change. His word doesn't change. In fact, Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. And so not only does God never change, not only does his word never change, but his counsel never changes as well. And so this is what theologians refer to as the doctrine of immutability. God cannot change. James 1.17 says, The Father of lights with whom there is no variation at all. There's no shifting shadows when it comes to God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You can bank on that. And we need to establish that as a conviction because the same things that he has called us to in the Old Testament are the same things that he has called us to in the New Testament are the same things that he's calling us to today. Why? Because God does not change. His word stands forever. His counsel is sufficient. Point number two, if you're taking notes, which I encourage you to do so, is this. God's word is enough. It truly is enough. It's enough for life and godliness. It's enough for our ecclesiology, which is how we do church. It's enough for your business ethics. It's enough for your personal moral ethics. It is sufficient. The scriptures are sufficient. Therefore, we cannot add a jot or a tittle to the scriptures. If you add or take away from them, you're compromising the word of God and there will be ramifications. So turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 and I want you to see from the very beginning here when Moses is giving the law that we have an obligation to not add or take away from the perfect word. It is sufficient. It is enough. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I'm commanding you, nor take away from it, 
that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am commanding you. So you can't add and you can't take away and obviously the book of Revelation capitalizes upon this verse and references that and that all the plagues would be added unto you as well if you do that. And so you cannot compromise the word of God. It's here for our safety and our protection and our sanctification. Believe it or not, a massive amount of staff positions have been added to what would be a biblical template of ecclesiology. Believe it or not, a massive amount of programs and methods have been added to biblical ecclesiology. What we actually do in service to God, how we worship him, how we come together, in our good-heartedness, in our efforts, in our genuine to please God, we have added to the simplicity of the word of God. But God's word is enough, right? Do we not need to just search the scriptures, find out what needs to be done and do those and be satisfied in the scriptures, right? Why add to it? Why make something more into it? Why add to it? Well, we've added to the simple and effective word of God and I'll continue to explain these things as we go. But nevertheless, we certainly have complicated ministry over the years and that compromises the doctrine of sufficiency, that the word of God is sufficient. We all have been guilty of this, and I'll explain more as we go, as the weeks unfold, but we're going to be faithful to strip away anything that we don't see in the word of God and just simply execute what is said and done in this to this worship place. Point number three, and this is our main idea for today's message. God expects parents to teach their children. Period. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 6 is all about. But again, I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 before we read in chapter 6. And by the way, this is grandparents as well. You see that. Deuteronomy 4, 9, only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently. So you see it starts with you. So that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and that they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and grandsons. You see the responsibility of family discipleship. How can you make them known, the scriptures, the word of God to your sons and grandsons without intentionality? It's not haphazard. It's very intentional. The Great Commission is very intentional. You cannot be lazy and expect dynamic results. But there have been so many things that have crept in in our lives and made us busy. There's so many things that have crept into church life and made us busy. And we have seriously negated the main things, the very essence of what we are to be doing. In fact, we have piled on all of these ministries and all of these methods and taken on a secular ideology of allowing somebody else to disciple our own. Whoever thought that we as parents would have a drop-off mentality and allow somebody else our responsibility to teach and to raise and to disciple our own children. These are some of the things that um, we've all done and uh, we're going to continue together in a better way. But God expects the parents to teach their children. Verse 10, remember the day that you stood before the Lord God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, assemble the people to me. You see that we are to assemble together. Age segregation is not in the Bible where we divide up into different age groups and we go our different ways. In fact, when you read the book of Acts, you see all the families together. It's just absolutely tremendous to see how in the book of Acts, from house to house, they are worshiping. And from house to house, they're listening to the apostles' teaching. From house to house, they are learning about God. And some crazy stuff happens in the book of Acts. And all of the children saw it. All of the children were a witness to the fact that in church, you will see both young men, women, sick people, lame people, all kinds of people, but they will, they will all witness in Acts chapter 5 these things, death, healings. That's because the apostles had that dynamic ability as they were called to be apostles, and there are no modern-day apostles with that ability to heal, so don't be fooled. But they'll also see demon-possessed people. They'll also see 
jealous false prophets. They'll also see pastors and preachers thrown into jail and imprisoned. Children here, teens, young adults, as they worship together, saw all of this in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, died in church, and were corrected. And so that worship service had an unexpected funeral service tagged on to the end. But let me ask you this. Don't you want your kids to fall down off of their training wheels in front of you so that you can help them back up? Don't you want your children in worship, in church? Because all of these things are going to happen with you next to them or not. And they're going to have a perspective that's formed of God. And you'd better be there for them. You'd better be there to help them and guide them to understand, thus saith the Lord. All of these things are happening and will continue to happen. And so as you see families that worship together, you have no reason to think, oh, wow, well, we should continue worshiping together here at Beulah Baptist Church. There's no reason why we should separate the families together. You know, in here in Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, it says that at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all gathered there in one accord at Solomon's portico. And so there where they were worshiping was a public area where they could all pile into this external room and have church, and they could listen to preaching. And so you see the idea of us all worshiping together all throughout Scripture. Now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and let's talk about these first nine verses together. And as we are worshiping together, and how we see that God expects parents to teach their children. I want you to see here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that it's more than just church that we should be doing. It's more than Sunday worship. It's more than Wednesday night Bible study. It's more than Bible study on Sunday morning. It is between you and your children. And that never ends. It's never too late, by the way. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1, now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson, you see that, right? We're all together. You and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God. And so when you're Worshiping God at home when you're expanding upon the scriptures and you're explaining them to your sons and your grandsons, that creates something that is indispensable. Right here it says that it creates the fear of the Lord. And in Proverbs 1-7 it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. The very starting point of their walk with God is with you and how you show them how to fear the Lord and how to reverence him and how to love him. And so, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I am commanding you, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it. Be very careful, by the way. Very, very careful to do it. I mean, say no to good things in your life so that you can say yes to the great things in your life, which are to be obedient to the scriptures. Be very careful. Careful, walk circumspectly, eliminate the distractions out of your life so that you can be obedient to the word of God. O Israel, in verse 3, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly. Hey, guys, you know what? Um, if you haven't caught on, it's, it's best to read with your finger in place because I pause and explain a lot, right? Well, here it is. What is Christianity multiplying today? Are we really doing a great job of making disciples? Uh, you know, I know who is. Islam are. Oh, man. The cults are. They know how to train and retain. Mormonism is. You know, when, um, when over on the other side of town, you have the Mormon ranch. And it's huge. There's tons of people there. And they have an influence. And uh, one of the values in Mormonism is family discipleship, by the way. And um, when you look up family discipleship, you see there's more written by the Mormons than there is by Christians. This is a gaping hole in our Christian lives. We got to address it. We got to fix it. And guess what? Growing up, I always saw Christians who professed to be Christians convert to Mormonism all the time because of the influence. I never saw Mormons converting to Christianity. It's just the fact of my personal observation. 
And today we see Jehovah's Witnesses as well who are doing a dynamic, might I say evil job of discipling their members. They won't come here. They've been instructed not to. They won't listen to your word. They've been instructed not to. They know how to answer the hard questions. They've been taught how to. They are doing a great job of training and retaining. But here we see that we should be multiplying, and we're going to fix that. Just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, don't conflate New Testament blessings and Old Testament blessings. In the Old Testament, Israel was blessed with physical blessings. In the New Testament, believers are blessed with spiritual blessings. So when you see milk and honey, it is uh, descriptive of the invisible blessings like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, mercy, and all these wonderful things that God would bestow upon you who are dedicated to him. And by the way, you know that the invisible blessings are worth so much more than the physical blessings. Who of you would rather have um, the cattle on a thousand hills or a huge ranch and yet a horrific marriage, right? Who, who of you would rather have a billion dollars and yet kids who want to kill you? That, that's not true. So it's the spiritual blessings of a life and legacy in Christ are what God wants for us. And so verse four, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse five, you shall Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. You see that all of your being here is to be completely consumed in loving God. And how do you do that? Well, it's intentional. You learn God's word and you can love him with your mind. You sing God's word and you can sing from your soul and your heart. And then you serve God's uh, serve God with your hands and your feet and your time. And you can do that with all of your might. In verse 6, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. So it starts with you and your personal walk with Christ. And then verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall walk of them, uh, when, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Folks, every day, all day, it's all about God. Everything you say and do should be bringing glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you can't do it in honor of him, if you can't say it in honor of him, don't do it and don't say it. And uh, at the same time, why you do what you do and how you do what you do is very, very important. And if you have your sons and daughters with you as you go through life and a trial comes your way, then your kids and your grandkids will see how to overcome a trial in your life because of your witness. You'll be able to teach them these things. And so while you're sitting, while you're walking, while you're lying down, while you're rising up, while you're doing life every day, all day, we should be teaching them about the things of God and the ways of God. And then in verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And whether or not the, all of the commandments and the laws that you see or ceremonial or civil or moral in the Old Testament, the ones that apply are the ones that apply, especially the morals they apply, the civil laws, all the dietary stuff, you know. I mean, I love to eat meat and cheese at the same time, but the Israelites couldn't, and there was a reason for that. The Israelites couldn't eat, you know, pig, and I know many of you love your barbecue here in the South, and so do I, but there were reasons for those dietary laws for them to be set aside from the pagan nations. And, um, and so the civil laws, you don't want to get them conflated with today's application. Take the moral laws and make sure that you do them when you read the scriptures. Let me ask you a question. If we don't, what's going to happen? What if we don't? If we don't disciple our own, if we don't keep our families together, if we allow Satan to continue this divisive work, what'll happen? Well, in 1 Kings 15, 3, it's pretty obvious. It says, he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had committed before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God like the heart of his father David. David was a mighty man of war, but just like Billy Graham has confessed and testified, the calling on his life came at an expense of him being a good father. And so when you put God's work above your own family, it's a bit out of balance there, and there's a price to pay. 
And um, I'm saying nothing that hasn't been in print from Billy Graham himself. And so we can recognize the fact that we need to fight against the American dream being an ideology that we embrace at success financially and having maybe the house or the vehicles or the amount of dollars coming in or the retirement plan is your goal. That's not your goal. Otherwise, you'll be robbed of the most important things. In fact, that shouldn't be at all your goal. You're, you have to provide. That's given. You'll be worse than an infidel. But Jesus Christ is the one who provides for our needs. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19 says. And so if it's God's job to provide, then why have we as fathers made it the goal of our life to just provide? And then when we come home, we kick up our feet and don't do anything else. It is a serious plague to the fathers in the Appalachian Mountains as I've traveled through and preached in many, many, many churches through Bible college and stayed in many, many, many different homes. As the culture is this, the fathers bring home the bacon and that's about it. They don't do anything around the house. They don't help with the children. They don't teach the children. They don't brush their teeth. They don't change them. They don't do anything. And they don't, they don't help with cleaning. They just sit their feet up and they watch TV. Every single home that I stayed in, it was sadly that being the testimony. And so how have we allowed a worldly culture to rob us of such meaningfulness except for the fact that we've been distracted and we need to repent of these things and head in a more biblical direction. Not that anybody's intentions were insincere. Not that anybody did it on purpose. But you know, that's where Satan really gets us. He just distracts us and keeps us from the greatness which God has. And guess who pays the consequences for it? The next generation, right? It's so sad. But if we talk about these things humbly before the Lord today, maybe we can reshape our church culture and create a new paradigm here that's more biblical and, um, and spread that around and let folks know. In fact, I believe that God is bringing three CC groups to this wonderful church. Classical Conversations is a homeschool network. And many, many families get what I'm saying. Lots of homeschool families understand that church by and large has missed it and how we do church and the values that homeschoolers would have are the same values for which I'm setting before you today and for the rest of the month. I want everybody to understand that uh, we're going to worship together and we're going to embrace the kids. And by the way, if a kid makes a noise or drops a sippy cup or a crayon or makes a noise or cries, keep looking this direction. Don't make the parent feel out of place, right? Just, just say, you know what? I like what Vody Bauckham said. He said, when did we ever become comfortable with not hearing children in worship, right? When did we start doing this? And I've got books that you can read on this subject as well, but I primarily want you to see it in God's word first. What if we don't? Well, that's what happened. But, but what if we do? Proverbs 13, 22 says this. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves inheritance to his children's children. Isn't that great? What kind of inheritance do you want to leave for your children's children? Do you want to leave a spiritual legacy, a foundation of God? Do you want to be all about the Lord? Do you want your children and grandchildren and nieces and uncles and everybody else around you to know that you serve God? You didn't allow the boss at work to push you around and keep you from serving God. You said, nope, I'll go somewhere else before you force me to work, you know, when, when I want to be worshiping God. And if you work me too much to where I cannot be with my wife and protect my marriage and love on my children and worship with them and have Bible study, if I'm exhausted, if I can't do it, then I can't do it. That's just the way it is. The men today must stand up. And I've often counseled over and over and over through the years when someone is getting a job at the very point of the interview, set your standards and stick to them. Because it's just the way life is. Your standards will be tested and the hours will encroach upon what your values are. Satan works it out like that. I guarantee you that if you say in that interview, I want Sundays and Wednesdays as unto the Lord. And I don't want to work more than this many hours a week so that I can be faithful to my family. They'll say, yes, come on board. You're hired, right? But then it'll be tested. And then when it's tested, you go back he, you said, I agreed 
to this. You agree to that. Keep your word, I'll keep my word, and we'll be fine. You've got to stand upon these principles. They will be tested. And it's something that takes some fortitude. It's stuff that takes this as a, as a, as a mindset to get back to the biblical basis. So if we do, then we'll be able to pass down a, a spiritual heritage, and I praise God for that. So I think that you've kind of noticed that I've taken an outsider's look over the last month and, uh, and looking in on how church is, is done and seen that we have had a American worldview creep on top of the church, maybe a template of how to do things on top of what the Word of God says about worship and looking at a more biblical way of doing church than we've practiced in the past. And so this man-made template that's been placed over the scriptures that we have been in our good-heartedness trying to do the best that we can has added to biblical ecclesiology. And ecclesiology, I've said it already, it's just the doctrine of the church and how we do church. But I want to ask you a question. Is there a chapter and verse for a children's pastor? Is there a chapter and verse for a youth pastor? Is there a chapter and verse for a young adult's pastor? Let me know if you find one. I haven't found one yet. But we've tried in our efforts. All of our churches have said, well, the next best thing to do, since we have a little bit of room on our budget, is to get the next position, right? Folks, what has that done? That has simply usurped the role of the parents. And this idea of hiring a children's pastor or a youth pastor or a young adult's pastor to train your children for you has usurped your role biblically. And we have asked for that. We've been trained to do that. I have been a youth pastor and a children's pastor. I have done all of these things. And I look back and I think that was not God's best plan. No wonder it was so hard. I'm putting all those little youngsters in one room and I'm trying to do the job of 60 or 100 parents. No wonder they are snowballing me. No wonder it feels like a rogue wave hit me every single Sunday. And it's the same thing for all of the age segregation ministries that have happened. No wonder VBS has been too hard. No wonder all of these things. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder. And so I sympathize with you. We have put a tremendous amount of effort into it. But the role of the church, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, is to train and equip the parents, not usurp them. We are to be a training and sending agency for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to train them up in the way that they should go. We are to equip parents, not usurp them. And so men are God's method not ministries, not strategies, men. We are to disciple men and women. We are to teach and to equip men and women. That is the strategy. God looks down from heaven to earth and he, he created this wonderful thing called church and you are God's method. You're the one being sent out in the Great Commission. You're the one who has been made into a disciple. And now you are the one going and making disciples. It's not church in a box. It's not some type of strategy. It's not something that Lifeway has published and sold over and over and over again. And I want to say that I truly, truly wish from the bottom of my heart, I have told my wife this and we concur that, oh, it would have been so nice if we could have learned this at the beginning of my theological education, at the beginning of my calling, where has this been? Well, it's been right here, right? But somehow, some way, we've missed it and we've added to it. And I've said, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't believe I missed it. But that speaks to just how influential culture is. Our Southern Baptist Convention has existed since before we were alive and it has had a culture that has developed and many, many wonderful things have happened through the largest missions training and sending agency on the planet. But it comes with culture and it comes with us needing some discernment. The uh, secular school system comes with a humanistic culture and ideology and it claims to be non-religion 
non-religious, but it is religious. Humanism is a religion. Evolution is a moral framework. And these things are things that have crept on top of the church. And so where do you get age segregation from? The public school system. They started it. And so we see age segregation in education. And now the church thought sometimes it's a great idea and uh, bought into that rather than the old, old story, rather than the things that we have here today. So chapter and verse, please. And I humbly say, I wish that I would have known more earlier. I've spoken to many experienced pastors and they have said, you ain't kidding. I wish, I wish, I wish. I'm on the same page. But it's time for a more biblical paradigm. What will it take for us to train our children up in the way that they should go so that when they are older, they will not depart from their faith? You see the obviousness here. The statistics are loud and clear that our children, when they grow up to become youngsters and come into the youth, and they come to be college age, they just simply grow up in the church, but they never come back to the church. You see the problem. By and large, the statistics are very clear. And what have we as a church tried to do over the decades? We've tried to solve that problem by, hey, we need to get them before they go to college and hire a youth pastor, right? Wrong move. We should have been equipping the families. And when that didn't work after a decade or two, we, the big thing was hire a children's pastor, right? That'll solve the problem. Get them earlier, right? Well, that didn't work. Nevertheless, all of this has come, and now we're dealt with this fact. Nine out of ten church kids grow up in church but never come back to the church. And so we're dealing with that. God's only plan is the Bible. And I've had so many push back and say, well, this church has, you know, another church or this church or other churches other than, than our, they say, well, they got more to consider, right? No, we don't have more to consider. We have the word of God to consider, and we, at judgment, will be accountable as to how we obeyed the Lord. And so our children are falling away because we've added on top of the church the parents' duty. We've asked the church to do something. We've been trained in this way, and you know that the church's job is not to usurp parents, but simply to equip them. And so, we're going to be continuing to work through this in the upcoming weeks, and I'll be able to explain more and more what that looks like. And the very simple answer for you today is just simply continue on, because we're getting better as we grow together. And so, no major knee-jerk shifts around here. We're just going to simply continue in the Word and continue to love one another. And I have three points as we leave for our way forward. The third point is not on there, but I'm going to say it anyway. Point number one on how we are to move forward is through family discipleship services. And so what do we need to do? We need to encourage families to sit together. We need to encourage our kiddos to be with their parents all over the worship center. And when we see a young mother come in with a stroller, when you greet them out front, you say, bring that stroller right on into the worship center. We've got plenty of room for you, and you don't worry about a thing. And if by chance one starts to squawk and get a little bit too loud, you can step out into the breezeway, or you can walk into the hallway, or even into the kitchen. There's plenty of places to where if you're uncomfortable, you can step out and feel like uh, you're still there with your children. In fact, it's live outside, so you won't miss a thing. So we're going to encourage and celebrate families worshiping together. We're going to make improvements around here in the facilities to accommodate such. We're going to make some improvements so that they feel more comfortable and that families know that they are welcome. And we're going to move towards training and encouraging and expecting fathers to lead their families spiritually. This is a, a lot of work on our end to disciple one another to see what that looks like. And so point number two is everyone discipling someone. And like I said, this is going to unfold as the weeks come forward, so don't, don't be frightened. But this here, everyone discipling someone, is the Great Commission. It is the Next Steps ministry that's on the wall back there. And we're going to equip you to be able to share the scriptures with someone else and to sit with them and to participate in the Great Commission, to do what 2 Timothy 2, 2 says for us, to do. All right. 
And then the third one is to take the scriptures seriously and study them. Take them seriously. We've talked about how God doesn't change today. We've talked about how the scriptures are sufficient. They're enough. They don't change today. So we need to study the scriptures and find out exactly what it is to embrace this. We already have as a core value to do verse by verse teaching, right? We already do that in our Bible study groups. We already do that on Sunday morning. We want to equip you to be able to do that. Point number three is to take the scriptures seriously and to study them. How do you do that? Well, our 3D Bible study sheet gives an explanation on how to study the Bible. And our Bible study groups embrace that. This is what we do on Wednesday nights. We want to equip you not only to just surfacely read the scriptures, but to rightly divide them and how to know what the word says. How can you defend your soul against the enemy who is very, very good at creeping in? You must know how to study the word of God. How can your sons and daughters know how not to be distracted? You must know how to teach them. And so we have a wonderful card coming up. We've printed a bunch of them, a 3D Bible study sheet. And so in the weeks coming, we're just going to talk about the simple steps and how to dig down a little bit deeper than just reading on the surface level. So thank you today for coming. And I want to pray with you before we sing one last song. Pray with me if you would. Father, we love you. This uh, discipleship family service is something that you want us to do. You want us to head in that direction. And Father, I pray for more families to be trusted into our care here at Beulah Baptist Church. I pray for more young couples to come and to find this as a place to where they can serve and latch on to this direction and participate in it. And I pray that they would spread the good news about how we here at Beulah Baptist Church, we just simply want to be biblical and humble and simple because we believe in the sufficiency of your word. We love you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for the message today. And Father, if there's anyone here who has never been called upon by your good Holy Spirit to repent of their sins and to confess them and to be saved, I pray that you would do that. Lord, if there's anyone who has never, ever fallen on their face and been sorrowful for the things that they've done wrong, you've said very clearly that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Lord, if anyone here has never done that before, if they've never been saved, I pray by your good Holy Spirit that you would draw them, that you would draw them in a way that their sins that are so prevalent in their life would bring a conviction to their soul. And you say in 2 Corinthians 7.10 that this godly sorrowfulness will lead them to repentance. And as they start to repent and confess their sins to you, God, your good Holy Spirit will save their soul because that leads to salvation. That's the process, Lord. That's what you've given us. And so I pray, Father, if anyone here has never truly come face to face with the fact that they are a sinner, that they would realize that heaven is not their home at this moment. They need to be saved. And Lord, if anyone has ever made a shallow profession as a youngster, but yet they never really truly have been saved before. Maybe they raised their hand in a rally. Maybe they filled out a card. Maybe they made a profession, but they seriously have never truly been saved. Only they know that and you know that, God. And I pray that your tender Holy Spirit would draw them, Lord. Show them the error of their way so that we may see people saved and baptized and growing in the faith. Lord, false converts and our country is a plague. There are so many who have been falsely converted or made a shallow profession throughout our church history and our methodologies and all of our ministries and all of those who have made a profession of faith, but yet they do not long for your word. They do not desire to use the gift that you've given them to serve in the local church. They do not desire for their soul to worship you as the deer pants for the water. Lord, I pray for all of those who perhaps think they're saved, but they're not. And so, God, use this dear church to be a loving light, one who reveals truth. It's the most important thing that we could ever do, Lord. Help us to speak the truth in love. Help anyone who ever comes here to be welcomed, no matter what state they're in with you, Lord. We love you and thank you for today's message. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.